Thank you very much uh, for joining us this afternoon. Uh, today we have the closing keynote. Um, I'm so glad to have our partner, the International Federation of Pharmaceutical Manufacturing Association. Uh, both the International Federation of Pharmaceutical Manufacturing Association and IAPO are non-state actors in official relationship with WHO. Together, we put the three arms of the health uh, care equation. It's the patients, uh, the pharmaceutical industry and the government, which happens to be part and parcel of the World Health Assembly. Over the years, we have come to represent these three part views to all of our constituent stakeholders, and it has worked very well. This session, I'm so pleased because I think from a historical point of view, I think there is no other important session like this one. And if there was an angel who brought us good news, then it was Thomas Queenie. Uh, Thomas is the father or Santa Claus, I think, uh, <laughs> to me, who will be whose members will be dishing out a lot of presents to us naughty boys and girls <laughs> with this uh, pandemic. And I think uh, if there was a Santa Claus, then IFPMA and Thomas Queenie will fit that bill. And Thomas, over to you to bring us that good news. What is happening in the industry? how we should be prepared and what everybody could look at and what everybody needs to do. Thank you, Thomas, for joining us in a tight schedule. Over to you, thank you. Thank you very much, Karel Dip. And it's such a pleasure and honor to be invited again to speak to you and to communicate and also uh, answer questions which you will have, because as I quite often say, innovation is meaningless if it doesn't reach the people for whom it's destined for. And I think this is no more true than right now during this pandemic, because until everyone is safe, no one will be safe. And we really need to make sure that uh, we are aware of the huge challenge and continuing daunting challenge of making sure that we provide treatments for patients suffering from COVID-19, but hopefully vaccines, which will protect us from the pandemic. And when you look back over the last 10 months, I must say, I'm really proud of how my industry has behaved during the pandemic, because early on, we realized that we do need partnership with governments, with academia, with uh, biotech, with international organizations, philanthropic organizations. But at the end of the day, it is really only big pharma companies with the know-how skill sets to mass manufacture the tests, the treatments, and the vaccines. And when you look at the great news, I recently gave an interview on, uh, on, on BBC and another one on Swiss TV, and I said, for me, the last few days were like having Christmas twice in a week uh, because you had the good news, the great news coming out of the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine trials, and you had the equally good news coming out of the Moderna trials. And when you look at the vaccine side, we normally talk about six out of 100 vaccine projects make it to the finishing line. 94 of 100 normally fail. And here we had the three first ones, which have shown uh, not just safety, but efficacy in clinical trials, huge clinical trials. They all had amazing results in terms of their effectiveness. And just yesterday, every Thursday evening, we have a meeting of the ACT-A, Access to COVID-19 Tools Partnership, with Dr. Tedros and the leaders of Gavi, SEPI, Global Fund, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, Welcome Trust. And everybody there was sort of over the moon because I think none of us would have dared to expect even four, six weeks ago that the results were so positive. 
But when I look at overall the pandemic, which is still very much upon us, and I've just every day in my tiny, tiny country, Switzerland has eight and a half million inhabitants. Every day I read about a hundred people dying from COVID-19. Every day I still see infection rates, which are far too high. Every day I see that patients are impatient to get, or people are impatient to get out of the lockdown. They struggle in our parts of the world more than, for example, in many parts of Asia to respect social distancing rules, wearing masks, hand hygiene, which have helped in many parts of uh, Asia to really bring down the infection rates. We also are not quite as good as we thought we might be in terms of track and tracing. Other countries are much better. But nonetheless, I think for the first time in the last 10 months, we are seeing light at the end of the tunnel. We are seeing the importance of testing. And I recently had a conversation with a Japanese friend of mine and Japan, for example, I couldn't go to Japan even if I wanted right now because they don't allow people from Europe in uh, far too high infection rates. But even once we expect to have a gradual reopening, my friend said, we will insist on people being vaccinated if they travel. We will insist on them having done a test before they board the plane, and they will need to test uh, to do a test when they arrive. And this is likely to continue like this for the next probably at least two years. But it means there's light at the end of the tunnel because without the vaccination, we wouldn't be there. Now, when I look at uh, vaccination, which right now is the biggest hope, uh, we have more than 200 vaccine projects. We have now seen positive results coming out of the clinical trials of Pfizer-BioNTech uh, with the official approval in the UK this week. I expect that uh, the FDA will follow suit probably end of next week. I would expect that the EMA will follow suit uh, towards the end of the year, early in January. And I would expect that WHO looking into the results is also most likely to issue a, pre, a PQ pre-qualification recommendation, which is crucial for use and approval in developing countries, also within days rather than within weeks of the recommendation from the EMA, which means we are much closer to at least some priority populations such as healthcare worker and the very old and fragile getting some early vaccine shots. Before we opened the plenary, I said, uh, being in Switzerland, I may have to wait a little bit longer because in the UK, they plan to start, I think, within days uh, to do that. Now, when you look at it, it is a bit of a surprise. And I think we also need to be very careful in terms of expectation management. Because having gotten that far, I'm often asked, hasn't it been rushed too fast? Because normally it takes 10 years to develop a vaccine. Here we had it in 10 months. Haven't either governments or companies cut corners and ignored the concerns about safety? Now, talking with the experts, be it from WHO, be it from regulators, be it from companies, I'm really confident, no. Because what happened is something in terms of mobilization, which we never had before. I just yesterday, I had asked a, a specialized consultancy to come up for me with the numbers, how many people are or have been involved in clinical trials for vaccines. And the number I saw exceeded 600,000 people. You know, the Pfizer, BioNTech, the Moderna each, uh, populations of more than 30,000 people, the same for AstraZeneca Oxford, J and J 60,000 people. Therefore, when you aggregate, never before has it been possible to mobilize so fast, so quickly. And also the regulators from around the world made it possible in terms of working 24 seven, accepting rolling submissions, going through the data, you know, from the phase one clinical trials, early data, coming back, looking and waiting for sufficient so-called attack rates, which you need when you do trials 
where part of the uh, the volunteers get the vaccine, part of the volunteers get the placebo, you need to look at how many actually of the population will develop COVID-19. And only then, when you find out that actually pr pretty much all those who got it were in the placebo group and almost nobody in the vaccine group can you really judge. Now, having said that, we have fantastic results with 90% uh, efficacy for both Moderna and the Pfizer-BioNTech uh, vaccine. And at the same time, and that's really the good news, since we know it will be a daunting challenge to bring these vaccines as fast as possible, first to healthcare workers, then to the vulnerable elderly population. I've seen quite a number of countries say, we will start with the over 80. Uh, and then go down and hopefully within the next 12 to 18 months really be able to reach everyone who is willing to be vaccinated. Only then will you also see how long will the protection from the vaccine last? Is there a difference in terms of effectiveness for different age groups, for example, the elderly versus the young? Is there a difference in terms of ethnicity? That's why it was important that these uh, vaccine trials are done on a global level. What I hear back from the experts, WHO, as well as the regulators, as well as the scientists involved, is they actually are not that much surprised about the safety. Uh, they did expect that in particular these messenger RNA vaccines will not pose major safety concerns. I think everybody has been caught by surprise by the preliminary effectiveness results. We need to keep our fingers crossed that it will hold. And I think one of the key elements and key concerns is that hopefully we will see early on a solidarity uh, so that we will not see a repeat of what we had during the swine flu, H1N1, where only the rich countries initially had access to antivirals or vaccines, where we will have a global rollout and where at least the healthcare workers in developing countries will also have early access. Now, this is easier said than done because it does require solidarity. I'm a member of the COVAX coordination meeting, the partnership with, between WHO, CEPI, Gavi, uh, which together with UNICEF will be charged to, to arrange the distribution. It also provides some quite daunting logistical challenges because the early vaccine, the earliest vaccine, the Pfizer-BioNTech, needs an ultra code chain. Not every country has an ultra cold chain available. That's why I would expect that you will see pilots in countries, developing countries, which already have an ultra cold chain. But it is important, and I'm cautiously optimistic that we will see success in rollout. But we also need to keep our fingers crossed that we don't have bottlenecks or nasty surprises. In the, uh, in the manufacturing capacity, that suddenly you know, a raw material is missing, or there may be quality issues, or there may be issues in missing syringes or shortage of glass vials. There are multiple things which need to be organized. And never before have we had a, such a massive. I mentioned uh, once in a while that the highest volume vaccine ever produced in the past was 450 million for polio. Here in COVID-19, we talk about potential of 12 billion you know, vaccines, which means 24 times that much. And we should never underestimate the risk that, you know, of Murphy's law, what can go wrong will go wrong. Therefore, I think we all are praying and keeping our fingers crossed that this will not happen. Uh, in addition to the vaccines, I think what we learned over the last six months is even with the vaccine, the pandemic will not just go away, which means in addition to having vaccines, we need to have more and more effective treatments. I heard last night from Jeremy Farrar from the Wellcome Trust that mortality, even without the magic bullet, mortality of COVID-19 patients in hospital has gone down by more than 30% just because one knows better about oxygen use. 
We know better by the giving anticoagulants, you know, blood thinners to patients in an early stage. We do have some positive results from dexamethasone. And most of the doctors I talk to say that actually remdesivir, which incidentally in India costs a fraction of what it costs in industrialized countries. Industrialized countries, we talk about about $2,400 so or $2,700 per treatment regime. I think in India, I talked to a friend of mine the other day who said, oh, I was surprised it's $37 dollar a dose because of the licensing agreements and he apparently got it for his parents who benefited from it but we do need more and better treatments and the biggest hope is on monoclonal antibodies many of you may have read that's actually what donald trump got early on in a massive high dose uh, when he went to hospital the monoclonal antibodies are extremely complex to manufacture that's why i'm really pleased that we also see their collaboration from example, Ayavi with the Serum Institute of India and Merck Darmstadt, German Merck, uh, to also help to increase the capacity. I'm very pleased that for example, Eli Lilly has signed an agreement with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation to uh, have monoclonal antibodies manufactured in a Denmark facility exclusively for supply to developing countries. And we also hope that we will see new and better antivirals because we will need, in addition to the vaccine, to have better treatments. In terms of, I think, the challenges we have is, I know many people who are impatient to be vaccinated, but I also know people who say, I never want to be vaccinated. And uh, I, we see vaccine hesitancy in many parts of the world. And I think we will not be able to overcome that by imposing vaccination on people. One needs to listen to the concerns. One needs to talk about why, why are these vaccines actually helping to prevent COVID-19? Why are these vaccines safe and effective considered by all the leading regulatory agencies and we really need a massive uh, education and listening campaign where you will have who unicef and many others need to be involved because otherwise we will never reach what's called herd immunity but rather than you know going on and on i'm really interested to answer questions i'm really pleased that i was invited again by Ayapo, then I'm happy to respond to any question you may have. But I must say, I'm really so pleased that the industry did walk the talk, did come up with the vaccines at amazing speed without cutting corners. We are likely to see at least two, three more vaccines close to approval or approved before the end of January. I would expect that we may have 10 to 12 vaccines approved by mid next year, which will give us much more uh, you know, options to make sure that no one is left behind. And I'm also pleased to see the efforts of multiple companies in collaboration with academia, biotech and governments to work on better treatments. But now I'm looking forward to the answer and question sessions. And back to you, Kavadip. Thank you, Thomas. Uh, the first question, obviously, <laughs> is a controversial. I don't know you're the person to ask, but I know you take a challenge on. Uh, someone from the chat has asked, do you think the regulators should show the same spirit that industry showed in working together and ensuring that we have uniform um, licensing and approval? Uh, the reason what they're saying is that the current spat between FDA and the UK MHRA. Do you think we can achieve that amongst the regulators? Maybe bring up uh, regulatory harmonization? <laughs> what do you think? There, actually, I think for once, I would expect we will have pretty harmonized rules of approval. Mm -hmm. We may see some slight differences. Uh, you know, I've seen the FDA already indicated they have a couple of questions on the interpretation of one of the results of the clinical trials where you had, you know, different doses given by serendipity or mistake. 
And, and I think that's normal. The regulators have to do their job. But I must say, I've seen an amazing, unprecedented degree of willingness from regulators to really work 24 seven, but also talk to each other. Uh, many of you may not know something which has the even more awkward acronym than IFPMA, it's called ICMRA. It's the International Conference of Medicines Regulatory Agencies. That's where you do have FDA sitting down with EMA, with PMDA from Japan, with the stringent regulatory agencies of the world, Canada, Australia, UK, and Switzerland is also part of that. And they have been on it. They have been discussing, for example, what is the target product port, uh, uh, profile? What do we you know, impose as a minimum efficacy standard? And that's where these 95%, which you saw in the Pfizer, BioNTech, and Moderna trials are so amazing because the FDA asked for at least 50% efficacy. And now you seem to get 90% plus. And therefore, there's really a contact with them. On top of that, companies as well as the regulators committed to way exceeding the normal regulatory rules on transparency. For instance, uh, companies, quite many companies have published the clinical uh, protocols uh, upfront so that you see what are you looking for. Uh, companies have committed to publishing the details of the trials good or bad, and now, of course, the regulators will dig deep into the results and look at, are there differences in terms of gender, age group? Is there something hidden in there? And everybody who was involved in a vaccine trial will be part of a pharmacovigilance surveillance uh, you know, program, very close one for at least two years. Uh, because we don't know yet how long the protection lasts. We don't know yet what exactly the ADR profile will be, or can, if you are vaccinated, can you still transmit? Therefore, yes, I believe they will do the job. Great. Um, any questions to thank um, Thomas on his uh, com contributions here? Ratna? Um. No comments, just that, uh, you know, somebody said that unless we have hope, we can't move forward. Um, until a few months back, hope was just some kind of a dream. But uh, after hearing what you said, Thomas, uh, it is now more concrete and we can look forward to a more uh, safer, beautiful world because the last one year was dreadful, especially in countries like India, which is so thickly populated. There was so much of uh, you know anguish because people uh, weren't very sure as to how we would manage uh, the pandemic. That the the social distancing norms, etc., worked. But in the long run, we do need the vaccine. We know we do need you know cutting edge medicines, and it's so heartening to hear that there are so many solutions available. Um, of course, the challenge would be in countries like India, China, Africa, etc. Uh, the logistics and how do we manage that? And, but I'm sure we will come to a solution for that as well. I, I just had one question and uh, I know there has been a lot of discussion on this and um, various countries have various methods of choosing who gets the vaccine first and who does not get it. Uh, but, you know, in most of these developing countries where access to even normal procedures is a big uh, challenge. Um, is there some unified program or thought process from the industry on how they will help? Because I do know that for other areas, you do have say ac access programs or expanded access programs. Is there something similar for vaccines as well for maybe the poorest of poor countries or very vulnerable countries or countries uh, in catastrophe or at war? Now, there are a couple of answers to your, uh, to your very uh, important question, Ratna. Now, the first one, even before your question is, the good news is that next to the United States, India has the second highest manufacturing capacity. And let's face yes. it, you're better off if you do have manufacturing in your country than in the True. one next door, uh, because India has a, based on the intel I have a manufacturing capacity of almost 2.3 billion doses. Uh, the US is 4.7, but the Indian one exceeds the one in China. Therefore, yes. that's not bad. 
The second one, I think important element in terms of who should get it is we in the COVAX partnership with WHO, WHO actually was tasked to come up with allocation policy recommendations. And the policy recommendations there are uh, prioritize healthcare workers, which may also include nursing homes. That's what you see happening in the UK right now. That's just yeah. about 1% of the global population, which means that should be feasible. Then look at yeah. the vulnerable. The vulnerable are the elderly, whether you start at 65 or uh, above 80, but normally it's you look at the above 65. Thirdly, you look at the other vulnerable, which are multimorbidity. When you look at you know, mortality rates, case fatality rates, it is diabetes, hypertension, obesity, which really, and therefore that's really how one should do. Now, of course, every single country is sovereign how they want to do it. You may have a country which starts with the army, which would not be my preference, to be honest. <laughs> But, yeah. but it, it is, and I think that's where civil society and patients need to be watchful of, you know, their rulers or their governments, who gets it first. In terms of poor countries, I think an important element is really this COVAX facility, which was based on the learnings from H1N1, which is absolutely unacceptable. Now, the COVAX facility aims to get 2 billion doses to people, you know, involved in the COVAX facility. Now, 2 billion doses, that it will not be enough for all the developing countries. Now, when I look at bilateral deals, normally people only talk about vaccine nationalism in the US. Now, to be honest, actually, when I look yeah. at India, I wouldn't see India very different from the US in terms <laughs> of, of who gets it. And Prime Minister Modi, I think, in that in, in, in that context is not different. And you have many developing countries like Brazil, but also South Africa. Therefore, you will have a mix of this global distribution mechanism where you will have Gavi and UNICEF, but also the World Bank very much involved. But you have a num quite a number of countries signing bilateral deals uh, like Mexico, Brazil, uh, and, and others. Uh, at the end of the day, we are likely to see a mix. I sincerely hope, and just this morning and last night, I talked to, for example, the founder of the BioNTech, and I talked to Seth Barkley from, uh, from COVAX, from Gavi, and we all violently agree we want to get some vaccines into the COVAX developing country population to the healthcare workers within the first, hopefully, month of the rollout. Now, of course, that will only be possible if it's approved which means yeah. the countries need to have their proper legislation. And if every one of the 195 countries signed up to COVAX would say, we will do our own approval job, oh my God, you might wait till 24. <laughs> and now, <laughs> that's where WHO is so important. Thank you. But I'm actually cautiously optimistic. The world will not be perfect. We are more likely yeah. to read about bottlenecks and this is going wrong and that, but I see a, a sense of togetherness. Therefore, I'm really important. I I'm optimistic. Thank you. Uh, thank, thank, you. So thank you, Thomas. I uh, will let you go now and I think you stay on uh, everybody and uh, we'll finish the session. Thomas, thank you very much for your great effort. You Thanks a lot for having me thank again. You. And I look thank you and so see you in Geneva next year. Yeah. See yeah. you and take care. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you, Kavaldeep, and um, welcome to the closing session. The, uh, we had two great days of uh, discussions. We had a uh, lot of deliberations. We have started already receiving um, written feedback from several speakers and participants. Um, we had great participation in terms of questions being asked and um, answers being given from the panelists. Uh, either by text or uh, you know uh, through the chat box. So a lot of good um, interactions, a um, lot of lessons learned. We, we also picked up stuff that we need to focus more on and maybe strengthen ourselves as a membership driven organization and how to uh, move forward to strengthen our presence in this region. Um, therefore, I mean, I, I personally felt that um, it was two very rich days of uh, uh, discussion and dialogue. And uh, 
to lead us through the highlights of uh, those two days. I would like to now call on Kavaldeep if you have the presentation to just quickly sum it up. So while Kamaldi pulls up those slides, uh, Karen, if you would like to say a few words and then Neda could follow and uh, Kamaldi could then, you know, finish up with the summary. Karen? Okay. So, yes, so I would just like to acknowledge uh, the strong leadership of our APPC uh, chair, who also happens to be our IAPO chair, Dr. Ratna Devi. Indeed, uh, the last two days were phenomenal in terms of uh, participation. So we had over 3,446 participants from 66 countries with 298 patient groups participating. We had 20 sessions with 66 speakers from 16 countries and participation from 61 IAPO members. So you have raised the bar, Madam Chair, and uh, certainly it's a pressure for us who will host the third Asia Pacific Congress uh, in uh, Manila in 2021. Um, we hope to be able to deliver uh, such rich uh, content and, and very uh, uh, wide breadth and depth of our speakers. Um, and indeed, as you have said, the feedback uh, from the participants have been uh, outstanding. Uh, so I do hope um, to see everyone for the third Asia Pacific Congress in Manila in 2021. So over to you, Neda. Thank you, Karen. And uh, I couldn't agree more with what you have just said. And uh, just to echo that uh, the bar was raised very, very high not only for the third um, Asia Pacific, but even for the next Global Patient Congress. Right now, we owe that to you and to the entire team. I would like to thank uh, at this uh, occasion, the um, Asia Pacific uh, Organizing Committee. Um, very, very dedicated group, very diverse, very idea rich group that brought us to this uh, complex and very um, educative and informative program. Uh, of course, to the uh, to the entire secretariat and everyone helping us at the background that we have never seen them in, in the front, but they were with us all the time. Um, and of course, to all the participants. So just to echo um, something that was said by Thomas, um, still relating to us as patients. So he was mentioning that it was unprecedented and amazing collaboration that the industry has put on up in the past 10 months. Uh, we have uh, talked a little bit about whether regulatory bodies will be doing the same collaborative efforts. However, it is a clear message to us as patients that we also need to work across and be more collaborative across all the issues that we discussed. And in particular, the next few months would be test for us to see whether and how we can collaboratively work to the acceptance of the vaccine, because as one of the participants said in, in the earlier sessions, they said vaccine is not the one treating the disease, it is the vaccination, which means that we need to reach that herd immunity so everyone is safe. If not, if, if not everyone is safe, then no one is safe. So thank you very much thank and uh, back to you, Ratna. Thank you, Neda. And before I forget, we've thanked everyone but our wonderful team from Mustard. Uh, without whom we would not have had these two days of seamless Congress. So thank you very much, Gary and the team. You did a wonderful job and we are really, really happy the way the whole um, platform has been managed. And uh, of course, all the other team members who helped us with our social media and other stuff. So thank you very much. And uh, Kamaldeep, uh, you can now wrap up the two days uh, with the highlights. Thank you, uh, thank you very much, uh, Ratna. So we begin the opening session from Martin Taylor, the, the Director of Health Systems at WHO and Dr. Sanjeev Kumar. And I think uh, we said we are one family. I think uh, it's very important and that this one family has to act together. I think until everyone is vaccinated, no one is safe. So that's very good uh, thing. And Thomas has said that uh, herd immunity is a global issue it's pointless you being all inoculated and safe 
when the rest of the world um, is not, then you may have still problems there. You need to ensure everybody is safe and we can resume normal life. We knew the second one now uh, from Priti Suda, uh, the former health secretary. I think as in what, what in cricket we would say, she's a couple dev of um, all rounders in health systems. And she really put, a, put the thing in that we need to bring in all of government into the whole system working. And then uh, Dorothy uh, Michelson, uh, who really reflected her Scandinavian roots saying that this is a whole of society matter that this must be brought together together. Uh, so the pharmaceutical companies have delivered, they've looked at all their reserves, all their areas and looked at all the generics they can make things offer and um, make them affordable. And then uh, Satek uh, really brought on the Jensen and Johnson routes that uh, they're still looking for more, more for the innovation uh, this is not the end and all for the pandemic. We'll continue to improve what we have got on offer, still reduce the long COVID uh, problems. As you know, some of these problems may be with us for the next 10 or 20 years, they're prepared to deal with us. So the pandemic is here to stay with us for some time, but let's get safety first and then look at the long-term conditions. Uh, then we had a good session again on uh, how who gets vaccination. I think Thomas wrapped it all that uh, we, we do need the infrastructure. We didn't need the governments to now to come to the table. Uh, the industry has done its job. It's given us what we needed to. Um, I think we have um, led the horse, uh, the industry has led the horse to the uh, trough. Now it's up to the horse to not drink it. I think the government has to drink this water and make sure we are safe and really do that uh, job we need to do. Uh, then again, uh, Mike uh, Alzana uh, and then Nikki, Kitika from Kitty Kitty from um, NUS uh, really put together the patient perspective with Dr. Vichai that uh, we need to bring uh, other things. You know, let's uh, celebrate the great innovation we had in Australia, in um, in Singapore, in uh, Korea, in Taiwan. Uh, Asia Pacific uh, region should hold its head high. I mean, it uh, really inspired the world. I, I come from so-called uh, very high income country and we are supposed to be well developed. And I think you guys put us to a shame that there is nothing as you did. I mean, uh, we haven't still got our test and trace system ready and we are already now looking at vaccination. So it's, it's, a, it's an absurd world. It's a comedy work. If somebody wrote, wrote this script and uh, gave it to me to produce a Hollywood film, I would put it in the comedy section, I think. <laughs> it is that uh, funny. So very good uh, things from patient. And then Jessica Bean from Australia really put it uh, that they're beneficial. She benefited from um, some of the gene therapies. Uh, we then went on to mental health. Uh, this is a pandemic in the waiting. Uh, this is a pandemic, pandemic that will come at us very quickly. It's already manifested in earlier signs. Uh, I think uh, Dr. Anita Bucker from, as a moderator really brought out um, Miasma's uh, whole uh, way that how it uh, has now really made big pressure on them, put great pressure on them. And then Dr. Cannon really brought back that initial uh, first aid that we need. We really, I think we need to look, rely on those systems. Let's go back into simple things first. Let's make sure these things act quickly. Uh, let's make sure we are ready for the pandemic to follow in mental health. Uh, job losses are coming. We need to work on those, but let's not, uh, be in the same position and say, oh, what's happened? We don't have services. Let's strengthen them. And Dr. Nand Kumar really talked about how psychiatric care needs now investment. Uh, we have where we have got good numbers of say, a heart consultant to maybe 20 or 30,000 people. We have one psychiatric um, psychiatrist to maybe two or 3 million people and it's un unacceptable. We need to invest in this now as long as health and well-being go together and mental health is part of that uh, well-being story. Uh, then we had the patient engagement and research and regulation really brought out a good idea that uh, universal health coverage does need a lot of effort now. We have to deliver it by 2030. Dr. Eduardo Banzan from uh, Asian Development Bank really talked about the investment in universal health care and that investment is patient engagement, enabling us that uh, 
um, ecosystem and that uh, environment within which we can contribute. Uh, Sunil Atate really pushed things about uh, how you need to put uh, R&D right in there and uh, it needs to be really brought out and patient engagement needs. And Chandrika and Larry are from WHO talk about health equality and how that uh, needs to be redressed and that needs to take on more important things. And then we had the NCD patient journey who defines it. And I think we really covered Narendra, uh, Fatima and Dr. Chandrasekhar really put things uh, to a perspective that yes, these journeys are disrupted, but the touch points we need to address, we need to really work towards and make sure we have uh, full um, coverage and understanding. Please access our research. We'll be putting that out for you to look at uh, and accessing. And uh, if you can email us, we will try to get you copies of that because that research was a seven country, uh, very important uh, touch points in there. Uh, it was a very comprehensive uh, patient perspective, lived in experience. It wasn't about just um, overall perceptions, lived in experience from Latin America, from Africa, AMRO and Asia Pacific. Uh, then the role of HTA, I think it's very good to see that it's shaping up, um, that uh, Thailand, uh, uh, Korea are well in, on their way, India is now catching up. And I think uh, with the HTAI and uh, our own efforts uh, to with PAIR, the Patient Academy Innovation and Research, uh, we are really pushing this agenda, trying to train up those uh, advocates. We need to uh, engage in HTAI and uh, take this forward because there are lots of decisions to be made, how to spend and how to get value for patients in society. Uh, antimicrobial resistance, I think Dr. Neda really put this forward that uh, this is remaining. I think uh, Dr. Sandeep Sarin put the India view and Jay Paddy and Tom, Tim Hanks really put, this is a pandemic to pandemic. You know, it's almost like mental health pandemic and this is to follow. So this is like new horsemen, as they call. If the plague and the virus is gone, these are three horsemen who are getting to saddle up and come at us. And we need to be ready with this and use over in June to address them. And day two really was again a case of starting off with making sure that patients and industry participation is brought to the focus. So we improved this uh, to new framework of engagement, uh, reduce some of the bureaucracy, some of the rules are affecting us, some of the issues that uh, impact us on uh, making sure that we have um, compliance. L then Dr. Ratna took on the study again basis on the NCD NIH uh, research, really brought out what was needed and what was done. And I think Boring and, uh, Boring and uh, Dr. Shada Bure really put some things forward and please get, write to us, we'll get this research to you again as well. And then health workforce, uh, we really need to strengthen this in this year of the nurse and midwife. Uh, very good to see the community pharmacists play a big role in this. And Dr. Manju Garat really put things out and Prue put things to the fact that we do need to bring in uh, that uh, aspect of uh, strengthening the fifth and the fourth uh, emergency services and that uh, we need to look at those if uh, the community pharmacist was the first emergency service, then the expert patient is the fifth emergency service in the community. And they really shone through during the COVID um, pandemic. They came out and helped us. And Dr. Ritu Jain really put the rare disease that uh, put out, it was, this is uh, uh, double jeopardized patients. You know, they were double discriminated in that. First, it was to the rare disease and second to the pandemic. Um, then patient harm was brought to the pen and I think Dr. Neda really pushed this because she really was pushing forward the agenda that the of our patient for patient safety observatory will be taking on an agenda that we are taking on with WHO and uh, Professor Kokhan Tan from uh, Singapore uh, uh, who is part of that uh, WHO committee on patient safety uh, where we can and Ja and uh, Bupender Rana really brought that quality issue into that. Let's bring quality back and that will improve safety, especially telehealth and innovative uh, services now. Uh, we need to bring credentials back into that. And then we had uh, the medical devices. 
again, very good uh, session and to say that safety and regulation depend upon that. It's no point talking about digital if this digital healthcare is not made safe and quality and that health devices have the power to make healthcare safe, integrate it uh, with the rest of the community and rest of uh, the health system and improve outcomes. Very important for us to have an integrated health system through digital devices and uh, access to the patient and improve patient lives and patient experience enormously. And then build back digital. I think we had a very good session again here with Dr. Sanjay Sood and uh, Colby Sandhu, where we said that uh, there is digital healthcare has, has a long way to improve uh, that access, but it will improve patient safety. It improves uh, access, it improves uh, patient experience, uh, patient outcome, it brings big data, it starts, uh, makes us see the big elephant much better. Uh, so far health systems are like these big elephants in the room, we don't understand them uh, with the big data coming through. And uh, health systems are now being affected by the disruptive element. I think after COVID things are gonna be new, new apps, new decisions, uh, new things coming in. And I think uh, IIT uh, system in India, Karakpur and others will have a great role to play. And then the patient academy part, we were introducing uh, PEAR the, from Nidhi Sarup, the patient academy uh, innovation and research. And we said we should follow your party model in Asia, but adapt it for our sensibilities and culture and make sure that becomes part and parcel of the health systems and respected and integrated within the policy makers. And there's a great sea change once we saw how your party had influenced Europe and European policy makers and the European expert patient community. And then we looked at communicable diseases. Uh, the old enemy is still there. Uh, there's a bacillus that has really confounded us that uh, TB and other initiatives started at the same time. We managed to eradicate smallpox. We haven't been able to deal, deal with TB and malaria, but we need to bring that back back and forth, forwards. And I think uh, TB Hara uh, on Desh Jita was a good slogan that uh, TB lost and the country won. That slogan should be taken over by Dr. S uh, Sachdeva. And thank you for everybody. Arindam really put that uh, point through as a fellow of the Patient Academy for Innovative Research. And I will quickly shut down that uh, patient-led innovation was the best session. I really uh, liked um, Dr. Achina's uh, thing about simple things matter. Yukiko is again, great expense and then, uh, Siddha, uh, Siddha, uh, Siddha Raju, who really talked about his own personal experience and as a patient, brave guy to come forward and really talked about the struggle at the social cultural level he made and how well he's done. And I'm so grateful for him to helping us. And I really love this panel. Uh, all the audio visuals will be present in our platform for the next 30 days. Please access them. We've got lots of things to share with you. And I will now, thank all the sponsors who helped us out. Without them, I think uh, this, uh, these uh, events are not possible. At a personal level, they went out and found us the speakers. They gave us that motivation and they really helped us. And I would now hand to the chair. It's la last two minutes. We are ending at uh, 20 past uh, here, uh, 7.50. Uh, Ratna, last word and thank you. Oh, thank you. Um, so um, as I always say, nothing ever comes to an end. It is always a part of a journey. So the Second Asia Pacific Patient Congress is part of the IAPOS journey in this region. And uh, as Karen has rightly already announced, we are looking forward to the next one in Manila. Hopefully we will follow that one up with one in Bangkok. We are also going to have uh, other regional uh, meetings you know, so stay tuned to the IAPOS website uh, and uh, please do subscribe to our newsletter because we will have many exciting programs coming up with all these, uh, you know, um, agreements and uh, partnerships that we are coming up in this region. And um, thank you everyone for staying with us for the last two days, for asking your questions, for sending us uh, uh, comments and, um, there are, uh, you know, on the APPC website, there are a couple of emails that, and if you have missed sending out comments or if you have something else that you would like to send us to, 
please send it to those emails and we will try our best to respond back to you. Thank you very much, everyone, once again. And thank you very much. Safe. And namaste, thank you. everybody. Namaste. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye bye. And that concludes this session. Thank you for your participation at the Second Asia Pacific Patients Congress today.